everybody to this evening's talk. And um, my apologies if you've been wandering around last. We had to change the room for a very pleasant re reason. The other one was much too small. But I do, I am sorry if you weren't able to find it easily. Um, tonight's event is one of a series of events con commemorating the centenary of the boat. It's organised by, um, by a group, a very informal group, called Campbell 100. And our posters are here. Uh, there's one event left, really, which is Newnham College on Friday. And that's a wonderful tour of suffrage me memorabilia that a lot of students at um, Newnham and Girton struggling for the vote. So there are still places on that if anybody wants to. <coughs> Housekeeping. Um, in case there is a fire alarm, just follow everybody out into the courtyard. <laughs> <laughs> if you, we are being filmed, so if you don't want to be filmed, could you let us know? Um, we are also in Canberra 200 um, collecting money for what we've called the Millicent Garrick Fawcett, the Millicent Charities. Um, they are charities that the suffragists and suffragettes will have supported. Um, Women's Aid, Women's Resources Centre, uh, Total Dirt and Rape Crisis. So although all the series are free, on the way out you will see a bucket and contributions to those women's charities are greatly appreciated. Okay, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Shahida, who needs very little introduction to a lot of us because she's such a well known Cambridge person. She was actually born in Melbourne. Um, she's a Bangladeshi um, descent. She writes for radio, fiction, non fiction. Her best known novel is Last Skull. And again, there are some leaflets there, I think, about it. And she's also a publisher. She's set up a publishing house called Perfect Publishers. Shahida works for the British Council, and she's stood also twice unsuccessfully as a local election candidate. She's going to talk to us today about two Asian suffragettes, Bitha G. Coleman, and Sophia Judith Singh, who was Queen Victoria's goddaughter, and I'm absolutely delighted to say is featuring on one of the new suffrage stamps to commemorate the centenary. So uh, I'll hand over to Shane. I'd just like to say good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming this evening. I know the weather is very, very dismal, um, but I want you to go home today and understand and learn something new. And today I'm going to talk about the Asian suffragettes. Now, when we hear the word suffrage, I'm asking everybody this, what word comes to mind? Feminism. Say that again? Feminism. 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 Okay. Anything else? Feminism. Yeah. But when you hear about suffragette, what, what else can you think of? Mary Poppins. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Right, that's very, very interesting. Well done, Lizzie. Breaking windows and throwing away. Yes. Anything else, anybody? Suffrage. Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's about voting, isn't it? Um, militant woman, equal rights, political um, elections, movement, and we can say rallies, action, hunger strike and arson and bombs. Now, that, I think some people are actually quite surprised when they hear about bombs, but I'm going to talk about uh, what the suffragettes did later in, in the presentation. So this year marks the centenary of the Representation of the People Act, 1918, which some woman over the age of 30 uh, could vote for the very first time with December 1980, 1918 rather, um, marking 100 years since the first general election in which women voted in the UK. Now, Sophia Dulip Singh, the lady here on your right, and Bikai Jakarma are both compelling examples of Asian women who played important parts in the suffragette movement in Britain. 
in the early 20th century. And these courageous women, as well as others, joined their global sisters in a fight to, uh, for gender equality, respect and justice. Now, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my book because when I was doing research about Lascars, I came across the Asian suffragettes. So, Lascars were the first Asian seamen that actually arrived in England and they worked to, on British steamships and they ferried back cargo such as tea, coffee, sugar, um, porcelain um, back to Britain. And my story tells uh, of one man's journey to England and how he settled in Victorian England and the desperate life he had. And when I was re researching Laskers, I came across the Asian suffragettes, the Indian woman who actually gave these men a voice. Uh, so that's how I decided to find out more about it. And uh, you'll hear some more about it uh, later in the presentation. Who's this lady? Well, this lady is uh, Sophia Dulip Singh, and she was born in August 1876 in Elton Hall in Suffolk. And she was from a Sikh background, and she was the youngest daughter of the Maharaja Dulip Singh and his first wife, Bamba Muller. She had four sisters, including two stepsisters, step and four brothers. Now her father was the Maharaja Dulip Singh and later in life he was nicknamed the Black Prince of Persia and he was the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire and he abdicated his kingdom of the Punjab to the British Raj and was subsequently exiled to England. So he converted to Christianity when he arrived here and he lived his life as an English aristocrat but he never got over losing his kingdom to the British. And his descent into gambling, drinking and debt saw Sophia, her five siblings and her mother abandoned. His mind, towards, uh, his mind turned towards a permanent return to his homeland to regain his throne. <coughs> he reconverted to Sikhism again and he became particularly resentful over what he saw as the theft from his kingdom of the Kohinoor diamond taken by the British in 1849 to Queen Victoria. And he married his second wife, Ada Douglas Wetherill, <coughs> and he died a heartbroken and ill man in October 1895. And he was just 55 years old, and he was living in Paris at the time. So has anyone actually seen the film The Black Prince? It was actually released last year. You've seen it? Is it any good? I've not seen it myself. <laughs> yes. So, uh, um, you know, if anyone's interested in his story, you know, do uh, look out for the uh, Black Prince. Um, but it, it really does tell you the story of uh, his suffering when he did lose his kingdom and his life he had here in England. So this is Eldon Hall. Does anyone know where that is? Has anyone visited Eldon Hall? Yes, you have. Yes. Okay, it's on the uh, uh, Norfolk and Suffolk border. So this um, is the house, the Georgian house that the Maharaja brought and he turned it into an Indian-style palace. Uh, and do you all know that the, uh, the Netflix uh, drama, The Crown, the second series, that is actually, was actually uh, uh, filmed here. So um, I don't know if anyone's uh, watched The Crown, but uh, if you do, I'm sure you'll see this building here. So here's one of the rooms, you can see, it's very lavish. And again, he turned it into a sort of Indian-style palace. This is the Maharani Bamba Dulip Singh, and she was born Bamba Mula in July 1848, and she was the wife of the Maharaja. Uh, she was the illegitimate, illegitimate daughter of a German merchant and an uh, uns enslaved Abyssinian, uh, Christian Abyssinian. Uh, the Maharaja had actually been looking for a wife, a Christian wife of Eastern origin, to marry, so he proposed to Bamba. Uh, but it had to be done by a, a, an intermediary because she only spoke and read Arabic, so they couldn't speak the same language. Uh, so they married in 1864 in Egypt, and uh, he said his vows in English, and she said her vows in Arabic. But um, later on, I don't know how they managed to uh, communicate with each other, but I'm sure they probably uh, learned each other's languages. So during this time, British colonialism was at its height, 
and uh, many Asian women found themselves adrift within British society. Uh, most of them came as servants and they were called ayahs. Has anyone heard of ayahs? Mm -hmm. Do you know who they were? Can someone tell me? Mm -hmm. They were nannies, yes, that's right. And they looked after the English children at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, um, they travelled with English families back and forth between Britain and India and they took care of English children. So generally, ayahs were temporarily employed for a few weeks and they were often dismissed onto, um, in, on entry into England Sec and securing journey back to India was often very, very difficult at the time. And uh, it meant a lot of young Indian women being stranded far from home. Uh, and from the 1870s, we had many British high society women uh, and they voiced their concerns uh, for these Indian sisters. Because at the time, Asian women were seen, Asian women were seen as being helpless, uh, passive, and they were objects of pity and misfortune, and they needed to be rescued by their British sisters. <laughs> okay, so these three, they're the sisters. Um, it's, it's Bamba, Catherine, and Sophia. And this is their debut at Buckingham Palace in 1894. So you can see how very elegant and very beautiful uh, these women were. So Queen Victoria was very fond of the Maharaja and his family, particularly Sophia, who was um, her goddaughter. And uh, she encouraged Sophia and her sisters to become socialites. But Sophia secretly visited England, uh, sorry, she secretly visited India in 1903 to attend the Delhi Durbar. Now the Durbar was held to celebrate the succession of King Edward VII and his wife Alexandra of Denmark, and they were emperor and empress of India. Now this visit was actually the turning point of her life because she went back to face the harsh reality of poverty and what her family had lost by surrendering to the British government. So she witnessed poverty and inequality on a massive scale and it's something that she'd never seen before in her life and she decided to change the course of her life. So who's the lady in the middle? Does anyone know? Yes, Emily Packer, that's right. So the Women's Social and Political Union, UWSPU, was a leading militant organisation campaigning for women's suffrage in the UK between 1903 and 1970. And its membership and policies were tightly controlled by Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters, Christabel and Sylvia. But Sylvia was eventually expelled. Now, they directed a campaign that included <coughs> mass rallies, hunger strikes, and physical action. So we have uh, Emmeline Pankhurst in the middle and her daughter on the left, on the right side, <coughs> Christabel Harriet. And uh, this is the time when they actually left jail in 1903, which was in Bow Street in London. So Sophia decided to join the group in 1909. Does anyone know who these two women are? This is Annie Kenny and Christabel Pankhurst. So at, at the time, um, they had these three words, votes for women. It was very, very easy for them to create that and be able to spread their message. But one police officer told a suffragette, um, go home, Granny, this is too rough for you. <laughs> and uh, this was actually in the uh, paper quite recently. It's, it's a great, great grandson of a suffragette. And, most of the women were actually um, middle-aged and they were almost on their 50s as well. So, you know, I thought that, that quote was quite interesting. <coughs> so here we have uh, the WSPU. Um, it directed a campaign that included mass rallies, arson, hunger strikes, destroying mail in post boxes, physical actions such as breaking windows in prominent buildings, setting fire to empty buildings at night, and uh, churches as well. So their activities started off quite peacefully, but they had to step it up a level. They did do because they felt that their voices weren't being heard. Now, imprisoned suffragettes were actually known as militants, and uh, force feeding, as this picture showed, uh, was taking place. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst wrote in her autobiography, I shall never, while I live, forget the suffering I experienced during the days when those cries were ringing in my ears. 
No, but she was never force fed because of her health and her age. So this is an artist's impression uh, of force feeding and it appeared in the Illustrated London News in April 1927. So we're going to talk about Black Friday. Now, I know when we talk about Black Friday, we all think about the biggest shopping event of the year. <laughs> but what does it really mean? It's, it, it, it's actually, um, it was a women's suffrage event that occurred on the 10th of November 1910. So this was actually an invitation sent to one of the suffragettes, as you can see uh, here on this side. Uh, and uh, this headline on this Daily Mirror newspaper actually says, violent scenes at Westminster where many suffragettes were arrested while trying to force their way into the House of Commons. Now on that day, Sophia led a 400 strong demonstration to Parliament together with Emmeline Pankhurst. And they were met with uh, about 6,000 police officers. So as clashes broke out between the police and protesters, over 150 women were physically assaulted and two actually died from the injuries they sustained. 119 men and women were arrested. So we have to remember that men were also involved in the suffragette movement, those who supported these women, but they were also arrested. And they were protesting uh, about the Prime Minister because uh, it was Henry Ac uh, Asquith at the time and for his decision to drop the coalition bill, which would have extended the vote to about one million land-owning women at, in Britain at the time. But Black Friday, it was a public relations disaster for the government and the press took the size of the suffragettes. So you can see this picture here. Uh, there's a woman on the floor and her name is Ernestine Mills. And this is her husband trying to protect her from a police officer. So you know, the events on that day was very damaging to the suffrage campaign and it caused MPs to actually distance themselves from the issue itself. So in May 1911, Sophia, she was summoned to appear at the Petty Sessions Court uh, for keeping a carriage, and a manservant and five dogs without a license. Uh, she protested that she shouldn't have to pay these fees if she had no right to vote. So she's fined three pounds. So in July of the same year, again, she had to appear in court and um, bailiffs were actually sent to her house on the same day, Faraday House, um, and it was to demand payment of 14 shillings because she didn't uh, pay her taxes. And that, so they decided to seize her diamond ring, <coughs> sell it off at an auction, but one of her friends buys it back immediately, returns it to her. Now this is probably one of the most um, famous pictures. Has anyone seen this picture before? <coughs> yeah, this is actually on display at the Museum of London. Uh, and it was taken on the 17th of June 1911. And it was the Women's Coronation Procession. Now, the Women's Suffrage Societies, they organised this demonstration and they held it before George V's coronation to demand the right to vote. So you had about 60,000 women marching in London from the Thames Embankment to Albert Hall along the route of the coronation procession. You might also notice there weren't no black women at the time uh, in the suffragette movement, but it doesn't mean to say that there weren't. They were probably very private, they didn't want to appear on camera, um, but there must have been some women involved. But the issue of Indian women who would be able to vote in England, that wasn't being raised at the time, but these Indian women were involved in the suffrage movement. Okay, so this is the car of the empire, the woman's coronation. You can see at the centre here. Uh, and uh, it's the float that intended to represent the unity of the British Empire. So they had an empire section uh, on this particular day. So they had Australian woman, New Zealand woman, Indian woman. And uh, the suffragettes, they tried to convince women from other areas of the British Empire that if they got the vote, they would be taken care of too. So here's a, a close-up version of the uh, car of the empire. You can see how quite gracefully it looks uh, just looking at it there. And you can also see men who actually appeared, uh, who went on the procession as well on the day. So this is a Daily Mail article of the Sophia, as I have to mention that, um, in 1913. Um, and uh, they did 
that paper did always report about her. It was one of the most famous papers that actually always had some views about her. Um, and uh, she was also involved in the Women's Tax Resistance League, as well as the WSPU. Uh, but what supplied is she'd go to police to arrest her. Um, and that's something that the police never did. She was never arrested. Uh, but she was always watched by the administration and they really didn't want to make a mart of her. That was the reason why they didn't arrest her. But she would go on to throw herself under the Prime Minister's car, uh, publicly support bomb making, um, which was you know, taking place uh, in Britain at the time. Um, but she also took part in many acts of civil disobedience. And uh, King George V once said, you know, can anything be done to stop her? But to be honest, I don't think anything was done to stop her. Uh, but she was, you know, very, very brave what she put herself forward as an Indian woman to do. This is probably one of the most famous uh, uh, photos of Sabaya. And here she is in 1913, and she's selling the suffragette newspaper outside Hampton Court, where she lived. Uh, her father had been close to Queen Victoria, so Queen Victoria gave uh, one of the palace's uh, apartments, Faraday House, uh, as a grace and favour, and Sophia regularly delivered the paper by horse and cart, delivering um, the suffragettes in and around the theatres in London. And she became an influential, uh, influential, prominent figure within the British suffrage movement and an icon to all Asian women living in Britain and India. So Princess Sophia, as she was known, she was seen as a fashion icon. So every time she had something new or she went to a party, she appeared in the paper. And they liked to report about everything that she ever wore. Uh, so I mean, she was you know, very um, graceful. Um, and uh, she was always wearing such lovely, colorful hats. But you can't see the color in this particular photo. So the First World War broke out in 1914. And uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, she called an end to all militancy. Uh, she volunteered as a nurse, and uh, even though she hardly spoke her own language, which was Hindustani, um, she could communicate better in English. And uh, she nursed Indian soldiers, even though she couldn't speak some of their language, um, they had that connection because they were Indian. So she fought for the better treatment of Indian soldiers, and uh, this enraged the British government. So she took part in a 10,000 strong women's war work procession, led by Emmeline Pankhurst to support the involvement of more women in the war effort. So this is Sophia at Navy's Day in 1916. So her causes weren't just for uh, women getting the vote, but it was about Indian independence. Uh, she was a strong supporter of Indian sailors, which I mentioned, Alaska seamen. Uh, many of them were actually stranded here, but she gave them a voice. And her father had also been a strong supporter of Lasker Seaman as well. So by 1918, um, before 1918, no women were given the vote. But in 1918, the Representation on the People Act was passed. And only women over the age of 30 were allowed to vote. They had to be householders, or married to a householder, or had a university degree. Now, an election was immediately called after the armistice with Germany, uh, which ended the First World War, and the election was held on Saturday, the 14th of December. That's quite unusual for an election to take place at the weekend. So uh, it took another 10 years, though, until 1928, when the act was uh, extended, and uh, it, the Representation of the People Act 1928 was passed, and this meant that women were granted the right to vote on the same terms as men. But by then, in June 1928, Mrs. Pankhurst died, and Sophia was appointed president of the Committee of the Suffragette Fellowship in her place. So 20 years later, in August 1948, Sophia died at home, previously owned by her sister Catherine. Uh, she died in Cold Hatch House, which is now named Hilden Hall, and she was cremated in, on the 26th of August 1948 at Golders Green Crematorium. But before her death, she expressed the wish that she would be cremated according to her seat rights and her ashes spread to India. 
So as you can see, from a timid, shy woman, she became a revolutionary, defiant, radical princess. And she was a champion in the cause of women's rights. And her causes were also for the struggle of Indian independence. And she was a voice for South Asian seamen, Indian soldiers, as well as women's right to vote. And Sophia was a passionate supporter of suffrage for all women, whatever their the status in society. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Bikaja uh, Bikai Karma. She was another prominent uh, suffragette, and she was a passionate socialist. And she actively campaigned for gender equality and Indian independence. And she was born in Bombay in 1861, and she came from a wealthy Parsi uh, business family. And she got married at the age of 24, but her union wasn't a very happy one. So she spent much of her time in social work, helping women less fortunate than her. And she particularly was proactive in campaigning for a free India. Um, and in 1902, uh, Bikaja, she applied herself to help victims of the bubonic plague. And she contracted uh, the disease herself. Uh, she survived, but she became very weak. And the doctors advised her to travel to Europe to recuperate. So while in London, she was able to reinforce her belief in gender equality. And uh, she became involved with the suffragette movement. And the strength of the woman that she met and the, and the belief in the possibility of change fed her resolve to continue her campaign for independent <coughs> India. Now, this is quite a, a, an interesting one. As you can see, um, she was called Madame uh, Bikai Jakarma. And uh, she was the first person to hoist the Indian flag on foreign soil in Stuttgart in Germany. And she appealed for human rights, equality, autonomy from Great Britain. And she described the dev devastating effects of famine that had struck the Indian subcontinent at the time. Now, this is probably the, the very first Indian flag uh, design. Uh, and it was called the Flag of Indian Independence, uh, which was raised by uh, Bikama uh, Kaji became to Karma on the uh, 22nd of August 1907. Uh, so she based the uh, Calcutta flag in green, yellow, and red. So that represents uh, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, respectively. Uh, and the crescent and the sun again represent Islam and Hinduism. Uh, and the eight lot lotuses at the top, as you can see, uh, represent eight provinces of British India. And the middle uh, word uh, at the centre is a Devanagari script, and it means, we bow to the mother India. Uh, and it's the slogan of the Indian National Congress. So one of her famous quotes was, do not forget the important role women play in building a nation. Now this uh, design was uh, adopted in 1914 as the emblem of the Berlin Committee, later known as the Indian Independence Committee, and it's now on display at the Maharatha and Kesari Library in Pune. And this, this is one of her famous quotes, as you can see, uh, what she said. Okay, there are very few photos, actually, of uh, Bikoji, and I found it very difficult to actually uh, source some, but this is probably the only one that I was able to find. Um, while in London, she was dealt with a powerful blow. She was prevented from returning to India unless she stopped her nationalistic activities. But she was unwilling to step away from that because she believed in free India and for women's rights. And because of that, she was, sub uh, she was extradited to Paris and she was influenced by the suffragette movement. And again, she was a strong supporter of gender equality and she decided to be involved with other high-profile activists. And she continued her dual campaign from her home in Paris. But by the time the First World War broke out, uh, Bikaji said to, uh, she took an anti-British stand, uh, and she visited uh, army camps in Marseille, and uh, she asked the Indian forces there, are you going to fight for people who have chained your motherland? So due to her defiant activities, the British government put pressure on the French to do something about her, either extradite her or imprison her. So initially their efforts were rebuffed, but eventually the French relented and in 1930 
she served three years in jail. Now, Karma remained in exile in Euro Europe until 1935. But by then, she was gravely ill because she suffered a stroke. Uh, and she petitioned the British government to allow her to go back home. And they understood the fact that she wasn't in a condition to uh, continue to fight for her freedom and for the struggle. And uh, she was granted permission to return to India after 33 long years. So she finally returned home nine months before her death to die in a country she had fought for to passionately free. So this is one of the Indian postage stamps that appeared just after her death. Um, and uh, I think some of the stamps still have her image there today. Right, so, so this stamp was actually released on the 15th of February, as you can see, and there's a whole um, range of suffragettes uh, stamps available. But you can see uh, that these women are part of our history, and they fought for women of all colours, of all backgrounds, of all communities, of all countries. And due to their courage and persistence and dedication of the suffragettes, we've been given the right to vote and shape our countries. And that some of them lost their lives and their homes for our right to have a say. And this illustrates the intensity of the commitment these women had to gain their rights to voice an opinion. But it also illustrates the commitment of the men in that period, period to thwart that attempt. And uh, in Madras in India, in 1921, uh, women were granted uh, a vote, but only those who owned land property but it took until 1950 for there to be universal suffrage where it granted votes to all men and women alike. So here are the, uh, the range of stamps that have been released. And that, again, it was released on the 15th of February. Has anyone come across these stamps yet? No? Yeah, any of you post letters? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think they're quite uh, amazing. I have seen a couple of them, but it is really nice to... She's the first Sikh woman to have her face on, on, on the stand. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, very good. That's good. So just a final thought, really. This is Emily Panker, what she had to say. And it, it's very thought-provoking. She said that men make the moral code and they expect women to accept it. They have decided that it is entirely right and proper for men to fight for their liberties and their rights, but it is not right and proper for a woman to fight for theirs. And next week I'll be in conversation with uh, Helen Pankhurst, who's the great granddaughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, which will take place in London. So if any of you are interested, please visit that uh, link there. And I'm on social media, so if you uh, want to find me there, uh, I'm on there as well. So, but thank you very much. I hope you've learned something today.